Ready? All right. Good evening, everybody. Sorry to interrupt all the proceedings here, but it is seven o'clock. That clock is wrong. By one minute. Yeah. Yeah, it's seven. Welcome in. Welcome from New Zealand. Oh, they're saying good morning. Yeah, I suppose it is, isn't it? The weather is not good. So maybe you're watching this from at home in the comfort of your living room. Welcome to the Christians Foundations course. At the moment, we follow the Frameworks Theological course. Don't know where we'll go after this one, but somewhere. And then today, what a topic. Welcome, hello, and welcome. What a topic. And I'll, I'll wait, and then I'll announce it with excitement for everybody coming in. Welcome, teas and coffees, help yourself. Welcome if you're joining us and you're a Presbyterian church. So I know some gather together to watch. And welcome if you're not a Presbyterian church as well. We open our arms to everybody here in Park End Church. Not Baptists. No, I'm joking. Even Baptists. <laughs> <laughs> so before I announce this topic, uh, which you can see there anyway, um, why do we do this? Because the, everybody is a theologian. Everybody has a view of God. And that makes some people bad theologians. Because not everybody can be right. And lots of people have got lots of different ideas about God. So in this class, we go to Jesus. And see what he teaches people about God. And on him, we place everything. On the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the one person who's never lied. So we can trust what he says about God. And we want our hearts to be warmed. And then we want to pass the good news on. About who God is. And what he's like. We're down a few people here. Some people are away on holiday. So welcome if you're tuning in from holidays. Alright. So without further to do. Hey. You're going through as well, brilliant, yeah, over with Christian and Ben. Without further to do, today's title is The Universe Proclaims Jesus and Why That Matters. The Universe Proclaims Jesus and Why That Matters. Um, unless we see Jesus everywhere, we'll die because he's the one that's got the life and everything outside of Christ is death. That's what the Bible teaches. So we need to constantly be connecting with the Lord Jesus Christ who fills us with his Holy Spirit and reveals what his Father in heaven is like to us and guides us. And this topic is important because it should change the way that we look up at the sky and at each other and even your pets, your friends, how you eat how joyful you are each day, that sort of hangs on like the size of Jesus in our lives. Like I'm tempted every day to go under, but if there's a huge Jesus in my sight, then I won't go under and I can cling on to him, the rock. Okay, so for the last few sessions, we've been looking at the size and scope of Jesus. We've been looking at Moses, who pointed people to him, and he was the rock of the ancient church. Moses chose him all over all the riches in Egypt, and how he led the church in the Old Testament. Then in the New Testament, Jesus said things like this, All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So without, like, Jesus, we can't get to know the Father. And that's a terrible thing. Jesus would also say this, No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son. No one has seen God in heaven except the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with with the Father. No, how offensive is that? If you're tuning in in a, in a religion that doesn't include Jesus, 
That is really offensive. You don't know God, according to Jesus. And then Colossians 1, chapter, uh, verse 15, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So tonight we want a huge view of the Lord Jesus Christ. And tonight is a controversial topic, and I'm going to ask some questions, and I think you're going to say things that I think you're going to say, and then I'm going to try and persuade you that there's an even better way to think than the answers I think you're going to give. But past, in the past, you've actually given the dead-on right answers, and then the sort of my bit has fallen flat, hasn't it? But we'll try it again. So I'm going to give some history of theology, and then I'm going to ask some questions. Okay? I teach, and I believe that the Bible teaches, that... Jesus is the only way to know the Father. And I've just read a few verses from that. Some people in here agree with that. And they basically killed Jesus because he said he's the only way to know the Father. That's why they killed him. They crucified him because of that claim. Right? Um, but I think, now you may disagree with me in this room, that lots of question, uh, lots of churches today aren't actually as Jesus-centered as they might think. And I say that because sometimes I tune into sermons, and I used to do this in my early years. You could have like 40-minute sermons, and they're sort of about morals and how to behave, and then Jesus gets a little, you know, a little look in at the end. So you've got a 40-minute sermon about something, some sort of God, and then Jesus comes in at the end. And some gospel or Bible-believing churches, as they would say, really, I don't think, utterly believe that no one can know anything about the Father unless they go through the Son. It was a real game-changer for me when I was young in, like, my worship and my evangelism and who I talk about when I meet non-Christians, okay? So, my little history thing and then some questions. The people in the Bibles that you've got on your desk, they are Trinitarian, the believers in the Bible. They believe that God is one but three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. Okay? That is the historical faith throughout the Bible and beyond. All right? So when people used to think of God in the Bible, they would think Father, because that's what Jesus taught. Father of Jesus, and we need his Spirit. But in the medieval period, things started to change slightly in the world of theology. Now, the medieval... Does anybody know the rough period of the medieval times? Does it keep you awake? Yes, definitely. But a bit before and a bit after. I think you could say it's 500 to 1500. So, it's just expand that bit a bit. 500 to 1500, basically, in my English literature degree, they said that was the medieval period, and I think they're probably right. During the medieval period, and this will all matter in a bit, there's something that started arising called medieval scholasticism, as in lots of clever people trying to say clever things in the medieval period, right? And there were a few key figures in the medieval period who loved Greek philosophy. They loved it, but they also were Christians. And what they tried to do is, they started to teach about God as best as they could, but they were actually steeped in Greek philosophy. Now, I don't know if you know about Greek philosophy, but um, Islam is based from that, and it's all about this sort of platonic one in the sky, okay? This ethereal God, high above everything, a ruler, and not much more, definitely doesn't have a son, definitely doesn't get physical. And the Christians in the medieval period were trying to resist that a bit, but they didn't realize how steeped they were in it. Okay? After, and then they taught a doctrine, and it was based on the Bible, but also Plato, if you of Plato, and Aristotle. Okay? Now, there was one chap who I'm a big fan of, sort of, and he was called um, St. Augustine. 
Okay, nods for St. Augustine. Good guy, wrote loads of, bi a lot of big stuff, but, good stuff, but, when he taught about God, he sort of sometimes married a bit of the Greek stuff in as well. I'm going to get to that in a bit. There was another one, even more influential in the medieval period. His first name began with a T, his second name began with an A. And he's revered even to this day. Anybody, any name kick coming into mind for that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not Thierry Henry, the Arsenal footballer. A bit before then, Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas and uh, St. Augustine, they wrote loads about God in the medieval scholastic period. Those are the two biggies that people still read today. And they were massively steeped also, though, in Plato and Aristotle. And what happened under these guys is there was a shift of understanding about who God is, a gentle one, but a significant one. And people stopped immediately when they thought of God and who he is, thinking Father, Son and Spirit, which they did in the Bible and the early church fathers did. These guys started saying things like this in their works. God, first and foremost, is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. And Aquinas is steeped in that teaching. And it's obviously true, but what was starting to happen in the medieval period is it became the starting point for who God is. The starting point. After, though, we, we've just been reading Jesus who said, oh, yeah, no one knows the Father except they come through me. You have to come through me. Otherwise, it's, you, can't, you, you can't start anywhere. Okay? So a slight shift. Then, in the 16th century, there was another chappy who wrote a big book, and it shaped the Christian world forever. And he was French and then moved to Geneva. And uh, What was his name? J.C. John Calvin. And if you go up to my office, you can borrow his institutes. He wrote a book about that thick, uh, The Christian Institutes, or The Institutes of the Christian Religion by John Calvin. Massively shaped the church, even to this day. And this church, actually, its statement of faith is Calvinistic in its view of salvation. We are Calvinistic Methodists. Now, I'm not here to knock John Calvin because I'm not worthy even to tie his shoelaces. And his um, books are wonderful, but he was steeped also in Thomas Aquinas, Thomistic theology. So what you'll notice in the Institutes is, and I'm glad Phil's not here because he loves uh, Calvin, um, mind you, I, I do as well, sort of. But what Calvin can do is go pages and pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of explaining who God is and what he's like and not mentioning Jesus. That is Thomistic theology. Lovely stuff, but doesn't start with Jesus. Now, this was, I'm, I'm a bit controversial tonight, and not everyone would agree with me, and that's fine. That's what these classes are about. But Calvin shaped Western thought, and now if you asked most Christians today, oh, explain to me who God is, they would go omni, omni, and omni, before Father, or Trinity. So these are real issues because that shapes our whole life. Like if your God is one in the sky who's quite aloof and just looking down at you all the time like a security guard, <laughs> rather than a father who has a son and has died, the son has died to get you into that loving relationship, it's a big difference, big difference on how we approach God and tell others about him, which is the purpose of these, like in the school playground or in the uh, staff room, wherever. Nowadays. I've got modern systematic theologies, books trying to explain things about God. You can go hundreds of pages before they even mention Jesus. Hundreds of pages explaining God's attributes and not mentioning Jesus. And about 13 years ago, it was like a light coming on that that should be an alarm 
and it has been for me ever since. And I do believe God is omnipresent and powerful and all-knowing. But where do we start? And so, ladies and gentlemen, there were some German theologians as well, but we won't bother with them. They taught a similar thing. The God of the attributes. Stacked high in attributes. Mighty, creating ruler. But actually lacking in personality. That was the, that's the God of the 19th century Germans and the 18th century German uh, theologians. And now we come to this title. The universe proclaims, and I, we haven't written omnipotent or God. We've been specific. And it's an exciting one with all that said. Who does the universe proclaim? Okay. Now, um, Karl Barth, he uh, really went to town on that it proclaims Jesus. So a lot of what I'm going to say in the next few moments is from Karl Barth. Um, but I think it's time I asked you a question. Here we go. What do you think the universe says about God? What is the sermon every day that creation is preaching? Just in your group, or on a piece of paper, or by yourself, just write some stuff down about what do the skies above you, the moon, the sun, the stars, anything, teach you about God? It doesn't matter if you're wrong, um, but we'll go from there. Okay, so jot a few things down. Uh, if you put the slide across, we'll do it for like 90 seconds. More coffees here, everyone, as well. Teas and coffees. All right, 30 seconds, jotting things down, what do the skies proclaim, what's the sermon of creation? Ten seconds. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. So, um, there is a common Christian thought today. When they look up at the sky, they, it, they say that it says certain things about God. I'm, ch I'm going to challenge that tonight, and I hope that you've written down the answers that I want to challenge. So, fire away. What does the skies above us proclaim about God? Go! Um, his, eternal oh, I, power. his eternal power. Good. Rainbows, for me, always remind me of um, and obviously the creation yeah, promises and creation. Certain promises that God uses. Anything else? Things about God? Go on. Yeah, we'll start with you, sir. Yes, yeah, Psalm 8. Love it. Yeah. The work of thy fingers. 
Yeah, so the bigness of God, we'll say that. The, oh, that's the eternal one. You st yeah, that's Nick's, yeah. And uh, that one there, who is man that you should be mindful of him and the son of man that you care for us, Psalm 8. Yep, brilliant. Psalm 19, yep, going to get to that. Thank you, Ben. Pause. Not ready to look at Psalm 19 yet. Um, okay, yeah, so that general stuff. Right. Please turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 20, which will probably back you up in what you think you said. Where's my Bible gone? Oh, there it is. <laughs> Ex, uh, Romans chapter 1, uh, verses 18 to 20. This is the go-to text. For something that people today call the general revelation of God upon every human and animal. Have a little look at that for 20 seconds. And then I'll read it actually, let's go mad. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them. Because God has made it plain for them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Okay? Does that back up your answers? Who said eternal power? Oh, that was you, Nick. Yep. Eternal nature. Uh, uh, what's the other wording in these in this verse in this version? Divine nature, clearly seen by what has been made, so people are without excuse. Okay. Now, are you thinking? You look up at the sky. You see that God is big, and therefore you're without excuse. It's obvious there's a God there. Just look up. His handiwork, Psalm 8. It's obvious to everyone, even non-Christians. They're just rejecting it, that there is a God. Right? So you look up, and what do you learn about who God is? What do you learn? General sort of answer to these. Creator. Pretty big. Creative. Large. Um, possibly eternal. Okay? Right. Next question. Why is that? Why are your answers not as good as they could be according to Owen? <laughs> so you've made a list about what the heavens say about God. Now, the next question is, try and think now from Owen's perspective. Why could my answer be even better? Right, take one minute. Possibly the most confusing question I've ever asked, but take one minute at home and here. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Moses. <laughs> one minute. Hey, Phil, is here. Psalm 19, welcome, Phil. So why people at home do... do could we do even better than God is big and creative? <laughs> Wait, answer, take a minute and then heckle me. Thirty seconds. Yeah. 
All right, everybody. Welcome back in. So you look up at the sky. No one's allowed to look at Psalm 19 yet. That's cheating now. You're not allowed to say that. Not allowed to say it. Because Phil's written Psalm 19 here as well. So we're not going there yet. What's Owen's problem with someone that looks up at the sky and just says, hey, there's no excuse. God is big. Why could we go better than that? Any answer to that? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. A Muslim could say that. Powerful, wonderful, big, strong, creative. Any religion looks up. But the Bible says, no, we're all without excuse of knowing the real God. The real God people are rejecting when they look up at the sky. Um, now then, this is how Thomistic we are at the moment. Because creation um, reveals God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. All the way through the Bible, the divine nature of God is this, the Trinity. That's who he is, his godly character, Father, Son and Spirit. That's why I started with verses from Jesus saying, he's my father, you can't know him without me. You cannot know any, there's no like little bits of information unless they involve me. But nowadays, since Thomas Aquinas, the most popular thing to think of when you hear these words, divine nature is powerful. Yeah, do you see the shift? It's not Trinitarian anymore. Though he was Trinitarian, but the starting place. And so... What about these spicy questions? Can we get general knowledge of God without Jesus simply by looking at the nature of the world around us? I'm not so sure. Does creation speak about a God without the need for Jesus? I'm not sure. And you're still not allowed to look at Psalm 19 yet. Because some have claimed that Romans 1, 18 to 20 speaks about general truths. But Karl Barth, he was like, what are they? What are they? What could that possibly be? How is that specific about the Christian faith? Some people say there's information, vague information in the sky, but then saving information that God does on the side. It's like, well, isn't that a conflict in the message? What's this general one here and the one doing the saving there? That's almost like two different ones getting involved. Some more questions. What would be the purpose of knowledge of a knowledge of God in creation that isn't accurate and doesn't tell us who God is in his essence. What would be the purpose of God designing that? Here's a question. Is the creation, and Joe picked up on this, Unitarian in its message, not Trinitarian, which would make creation a heretic because God is Trinitarian. Is he just, is creation just preaching message that God, this one powerful being is created? Because that's heresy. So God has created the biggest heretical, heretical message in the history of the world over us. What about this one? If you did follow the general information of God all your life that he's powerful and big, and you get to heaven, well, you get to the gates of heaven on judgment day, and then this man called Jesus shows up, and you'd be like, well, who are you? You would, because I've been faithful and following the general information in the sky, and it taught me all about a Unitarian just oneness. I was following you, so I do have an excuse. Who are you, Jesus? Because I faithfully followed this, and Romans 1 said I'm without excuse. So if the Christian church is going around going, oh yeah, God is just powerful, like we're giving people an excuse, aren't we? They were like, well, who's this Jesus chap then and this creation thing in the sky? Uh, this one's a spicy one tonight, ladies and gentlemen. It really does change how we look up and who we worship. Um, right. What is the criteria that people get judged on on the last day? Please turn to John chapter 16. If no one's got an excuse and they're all guilty, what are they guilty of? Have a look at John chapter 16. 
verses 7 to 9. John chapter 16, verses 7 to 9. And take one minute to read that and just send it back to me in your own words. Take one minute, John 16, verses 7 to 9, and why is it important? Go. James with a slide. One minute discussion. Uh, John sixteen. Seven to nine. <laughs> Ten seconds. All right, five seconds, bringing it back. Okay, in a nutshell, welcome back, everybody. Um, John 16, in a nutshell, back to me. What does he, what's going on there? Sending of the Holy Spirit, and one thing the Spirit is going to do is what? Well, there's a few there, isn't it? Convict people of their sin, linked to Jesus going to the Father, and about the righteousness, and judgment. Um, in other words, Judgment Day has got nothing to do with whether we've behaved ourselves and been moral, or charitable to criminals. Sin isn't defined by mere morality, but our love and trust in Jesus, um, who has gone back to the Father and his righteousness, the eternal Son who we're made for. And that seems to be the criteria of life and death throughout the Bible. Are we with Jesus, are we not? So again, we're coming back to, well, would creation, if it's not going to give anybody an excuse, really not involve the Lord Jesus Christ. Now then, go to another really interesting verse. As we're building up to Psalm 19 that I can see people are putting in chat as well. Please read the Apostle Paul when he quotes Psalm 19. Please go to Romans chapter 10 and read verses 9 to 18. Romans 10, 9 to 18. In fact, I'll read it and give you two minutes to... Send it back to me. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, you're right. But, yeah, all right, yeah, good point. You take three minutes, read Romans 10, 9 to 18, and link it to what we're talking about here. Go. And slide across, please, uh, Jiminy Jim Bobs.
Only about 11 minutes left. One minute. Well, we've never been so quiet. All right, let's bring it back here. Welcome back, everybody. We're looking at Romans 10, 9 to 18. Paul is building his argument here from Psalm 19. And his message in Romans 10 is, Jesus is for everyone. Everybody has heard a message. What is the message? He quotes Psalm 19 in verse 18. Did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. Now then, everybody please turn to Psalm 19, which sheds some light on the universe's message, the Sermon of Creation. Really interesting that Paul says everybody's heard this. All right, he's quoting from Psalm 19 when he says everybody's heard a message. Everybody's without excuse. What is Psalm 19? Scan it for three minutes and your two minutes, and your task is just list something that it's telling us about God. Go. What is this message in Psalm 19 that Paul says everybody's heard about Jesus because of it? Okay, James, slide it over. Two minutes. Go. Just scan 19, jot something down. And I'm going to sing a song in the background. And you might want to listen to the words because you probably sung it. Jesus is Lord, creation's voice proclaims it. For by his tree and flower was, for by his power, each tree and flower was planned and made. Jesus is Lord. The universe declares it. Sun, moon, and stars in heaven cry. God is omnipotent. Oh no. Jesus is Lord. We sing it, don't we? But do we mean it? Right. 30 seconds. And with six minutes to go, I might not even ask you for your answers. I have a question. Yes, Ben, please ask your question quickly. Verse 2, verse 2, no two, verse 4, down with two. <laughs> That's too big. Yeah, that, what's going on there, I'll come back to you after, because there's something else I want to say before that one. Good question, though. Parked. Parked because it doesn't uh, affect the main point that I want to close on, but it's a good one. Welcome back, everyone. James sliding back. Thank you. Psalm 19 invites, this is the message that Paul said has gone out to everyone you know, and he quotes Psalm 19. Okay, so the other psalms about whether when they say God is powerful and all these other things, 
filter it under this one, because this is the one Paul says is the message that everyone has seen and heard. The heavens declare the glory of God. And then, did you pick up in this one, it invites people to look at the sun. Did you get that bit? Rising in the east and instantly defeating the darkness of the night. And this powerful witness travels across the sky um, every day uh, declaring that there is light who is like a bridegroom chasing away darkness. Okay? Light and life coming every morning by this bridegroom champion rising. When you get up and brush your teeth, there's this bridegroom that has chased darkness away from his bride every morning. Okay? And he ends by saying, this is my rock and my redeemer. And Paul says, oh yeah, the rock is Christ. The rock is Christ, that's 1 Corinthians 10. And Moses keeps calling the angel of the Lord his rock. Okay? So ladies and gentlemen, to the eyes of faith, there is a message that has gone out that we believe. And it's this, the daily cycle of the sun proclaims the character of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shines um, his light um, every morning and banishing, banishes away darkness. Now, if you don't quite believe me, here's Revelation 5.13, I'll just read it. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in it singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory. Every creature in heaven and on earth and all that's made singing a song, praise be to the Lamb. And now you're thinking a question and it's the question that we're going to end on answering. You're thinking, Owen, nobody I know looks up at the sky and goes, oh yeah, Jesus, do they? My neighbor doesn't look up at the sun and go, isn't Jesus amazing? It just doesn't. They don't. Non-Christians don't. And that is the very point that Paul makes in Romans 1, 2, and 3. Sin has so blinded everybody that the obvious truths about the gospel around us, we don't even see anymore. We don't see it. Paul says we reject it. We suppress the truth about God's nature. And so here is the last question. How on earth do people get to join in and really start to see how amazing Jesus is when they go to the parks, when they see the leaves and the animals playing? Good question. Here is where you come in and why this tonight's talk isn't just, oh, that was interesting, but vitally important. Please everybody turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, there's a contents page at the front. If you don't know uh, your way around yet, I often have to look at the contents page. So you're not alone if you've got to go there. Ephesians, Ephesians 2. I'm going to read um, 11 and 12 to, uh, well, close, I guess, and 13. Therefore, Remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth are called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The message of Ephesians is this. There is a message that everybody's rejecting. And they're rejecting it. But now the keys of people being brought in to know Jesus and love him are given to the church. That's the message of the Bible. 
The, the people are rejecting the stars above. So God has given the keys of evangelism and spelling these things out to the church. The church in Ephesus, the people there, and the church of Park End. So tomorrow, when the sun rises and chases away the darkness, the Christians will go, isn't Jesus wonderful? Sent by the Father to, do, to chase away the sin and my worries and my anxieties, I trust them to Jesus. He's risen like a champion bridegroom, like Psalm 19 says. And then what do we do? We say to our friends, do you know, I know this man, he's called Jesus, he's amazing. And I want to tell you about him, or why don't you come to church and learn about him? And that is the message that God now says breaks the power of sin. Gospel Christians just telling people about the wonderful Lord Jesus Christ. And you can read Ephesians 1 and 2 in your own time later on and learn the power of church. Jesus-centered churches. There you go. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Long story short, talk about Jesus and enjoy Jesus.